you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Thank you all for coming to my talk this evening. It's nice to see so many people in the audience. For those of you who don't know very much about connection, let me start by giving you some background information about it. Connection is a British organisation that facilitates homestays all over the globe. This organisation prides itself on matching tens of thousands of host families with guests every single year, allowing travellers to discover a country's culture in a way like no other. Homestays are ideal for both travellers and homeowners, enabling intercultural exchanges and the development of lifelong friendships while providing travellers with often discounted accommodation costs and host families with a steady income from the comfort of their own homes. The homestay experience is particularly popular with university exchange students looking for a more genuine insight into their country of choice and an unrivaled opportunity to develop their language skills. The homestay experience is truly unique and once in a lifetime and one that you will likely remember for the rest of your lives. It is important to note, however, that some people will find it difficult to adapt to the new country, with many enduring what is known as culture shock. Connection's advice for those suffering from culture shock is to go out and make as many friends as possible, no matter how difficult you may find it. Friends are guaranteed to help you feel more integrated as part of the local society and show you some great places to hang out. At first, it might seem extremely challenging to overcome the language barrier between you and your host family. However, you will find that you quickly overcome this and develop a very close and almost familial relationship. Many of our travellers have suggested that they have found discussing their hobbies and other interests with their host families is the best way to overcome any barriers, since you are more likely to find something you share in common. For example, you might find that you are both passionate about football and end up playing in the local field every week. One of our guests undertaking a homestay in a rural area of the UK told us that she and her host now take a Tai Chi class together upon a hilltop at sunrise, calling the experience absolutely breathtaking. After the first few weeks, you will find your understanding of the people around you and their culture deepens by leaps and bounds, and you will soon become one of the locals. Our hosts in over 140 countries turn a location into a culture, time into experience, and strangers into friends. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. 5. For next week, I'd like you to undertake a piece of research in preparation for writing your final essay. In order to gain top marks, you must include a range of primary, secondary, and tertiary sources. Are there any questions? Yes, Professor, I have a question. We haven't yet covered how to undertake this sort of research in much depth, and I'm a little unsure of what you want us to do. In telling us to include primary sources, do you mean you want us to design and distribute a questionnaire analysing the results? You could design a questionnaire, but you'll soon find that distributing a questionnaire on such a large scale is somewhat troublesome. We couldn't possibly expect you to do it effectively as an individual university student without the necessary resources. No, ideally, I would like you to form one or two focus groups and interview them. This will provide you with a more qualitative approach. If your strengths lie in mathematics, please by all means take a more quantitative approach. But this will be more strenuous and time-consuming and isn't entirely necessary for the purpose of this study. Professor, you haven't told us what our project is about. Do we get to choose our own topic based on the previous study? No, I'm afraid not. This will be a strictly Australian study. However, you can choose which angle you'd like to take, so long as it remains within the realm of anthropology. Does anyone have any questions specifically about the formation of the focus groups? I'd had several emails about this, and I'd like to address it now. My study is related to growing up in Australia, and the question of nature versus nurture. I've gathered more than 200 school children who would be happy to participate in a focus group. Do you think we'll need to include that many participants in a focus group? Blimey, Douglas, well done for finding that many willing children but you definitely don't need that many for the study you're going to undertake. I'd say you need no more than five children per group, and no more than three groups, so 15 children altogether. You definitely need to control the group size in order to generate a meaningful dialogue. OK, if it's useful, I'll try and do it. I appreciate your enthusiasm for the project, but there are plenty of different ways to gather data. And I'm sure that if you look hard enough, you'll find someone who has conducted almost the exact same research in the past. My advice for you is don't be too ambitious and try to include as much information about various people or sectors. For those who haven't ever collected original data before, what do you suggest we do? I would suggest that you read accounts from other people who have undertaken such research to see what advice they can give. I would also encourage you to read Chapter 8 in the course textbook, which should give you a good introduction to collecting data. Moreover, you should try to practice using the data table provided in your course handbook. By now, you should have read at least six or seven books giving quite detailed instruction on how to go about collecting data. Professor, I don't know about everyone else, but I'm having trouble reading the books. I had a really big assignment for another course, and I've been spending all my time on that. Jane, have you read all the books the professor mentioned? Well, my trouble is getting hold of the books. I've been to the library several times, but all the books are out. Sounds like you should have started borrowing books a bit earlier. Yes, I should have. But I got several ones from my friend a couple of days ago. I just skimmed through them and don't remember a lot of the information. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 2. Section 2. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Canvas Park Podcast. In the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little about the park and the amazing things we have to offer. We like to think that Canvas offers more than other theme parks. Like them, we have a variety of exciting rides for people of all ages, but Canvas also places strong emphasis on the educational experience for its visitors. Not boring facts, but lots of interactive exhibits. Although it's mainly an outdoor experience, we do have some indoor activities if the weather gets too dreadful. The park's got a lovely, well-established feel. Set in 80 acres of beautiful countryside, about three miles south of the tourist resort of Dulchester. The park was set up in 1997 by the Camber family, but then taken over by new owners in 2004, who have maintained the original vision of the Cambers. It has lots of old trees, hundreds of flower beds, and a gorgeous lake. Cambers has over 45 different rides, exhibits, and arcades. All but one of these is free once you've paid your entrance fee. We charge a small fee for our newest ride to reduce the length of the queues. You don't pay anything for parking. A family ticket for a family of four works out at about £8 per person, which is amazing value. Full details of current prices are shown on our website, along with full details of rides, etc., and directions for getting to us. We also have a number of special offers. For example, if you live locally, why not join our Adventurers Club, which entitles you to 50% off ticket prices all year round, and a special lane for all rides and exhibits, which means you don't have to wait to get into any part of the park. See the Offers tab on the website. We've recently added a number of new exhibits to the park, and we're particularly proud of our Future Farm Zone, which houses over 20 different species of animals, from chipmunks to dairy cows. The emphasis is on getting near to the animals. All of them can be petted, and you can buy food for feeding the animals. Many of our younger visitors say that this is the high point of their visit. And speaking of food, don't let the animals have all the fun. We have a total of seven different catering outlets on the site. We're open 10 to 5.30 all year round, and cold drinks and snacks can be bought at any time during opening hours. And hot food is available most of the day in the Hungry Horse Cafe from 11 until 5 just half an hour before closing time. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. The valley and estuary of the River Trelore 
forms an unspoiled, beautiful landscape, rich in both wildlife and sites of historic interest. There are many ways to explore the area, and public transport links are good. It is possible to leave your car behind and travel by boat, train, or bus, with just short walks in between stops. The Trelore Valley Passenger Ferry runs between villages along the river estuary and provides a link with a train station at Barry, which is about ten minutes' walk from the riverside village of Calton. In the past, the river was the main form of transport in the area, and as in the past, today's ferry service operates according to nature. The river estuary is tidal, and so the ferry timetable differs from day to day, according to the times and height of the tide. The ferry is also seasonal, normally running between April and September, depending on the weather. A timetable for the whole year can be downloaded from the Internet by visiting www.trelorferry.co.uk. If you just want to sit and relax and enjoy the lovely scenery, you can take a river cruise to Calton and back from the nearby city of Plymouth. In the past, steamships brought early tourists along the same route. Queen Victoria and her family enjoyed such a trip in 1856. The journey is quicker these days. The round trip takes between four and five hours, depending on tides and weather. If you prefer, you can travel upriver by boat and return to Plymouth by train. All cruise boats and trains have wheelchair access. For more information and for departure times, ring Plymouth Boat Cruises on 017-528-23104. Trains run several times a day throughout the year between Calton and Plymouth, with various stops in between. They are used by both local commuters and tourists who want to enjoy the beautiful scenery. The highlight of the journey is crossing the river on the stunning viaduct, which was built at the beginning of the 20th century, and towers 120 feet over the water. It is unnecessary to book, and tickets can be bought on the train. For information about fares and timetables, contact National Rail Enquiries by phone or online. The bus service in the Trelore Valley now connects all train stations and villages in the area. Especially for holidaymakers, there's a rover ticket which can be used at weekends and on national holidays and allows unlimited journeys on those days. The rover ticket provides great value for money and is now even cheaper than it was last year. An adult ticket costs £5.50 a day. Senior citizens can travel for £4.50, and a family ticket for up to five people costs just £12. Tickets can be bought on the bus. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3 First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24.
So the task I gave you both was to choose an article about a small-scale research project. Yes. yes. You were then required to try to reproduce the research procedures in your own context, i.e. try it out for yourself. Yeah, and that's what we've done. Great. So I'd like you to tell me a bit about the article and why you chose it. Well, the article's written by two university lecturers who had started using crosswords to help their students revise terminology for exams. And the crosswords were designed and set on computers. And we selected the article because, well, it seemed an accessible topic, even though we weren't familiar with the technique. You know, using IT to design crosswords for higher education. That's a good reason. So these lecturers wanted to see how well this innovation was received by their students. Yes. yes. So how did you go about reproducing the research? Well, we drew up a list of terms from one of our own modules and designed a crossword for revising these terms. Then we asked our classmates to try out the crossword and give us feedback, you know, their opinions on how they felt about using the technique. Was it easy to find participants? It wasn't easy at first, but then we convinced them that by taking part in the research, they were actually benefiting themselves by preparing for an exam, which is coming up later this term. And it worked. Good. So how did you find out what the students thought about doing the crosswords? A questionnaire. The original article used a two-page long questionnaire. There were lots of excellent questions on it, but the whole section on difficulties using IT is now obsolete. Old-fashioned, even, even though it had only been written a couple of years ago. So you designed a shorter version? Yeah. Then we sent it to the 40 students by email and got 28 replies. I was taken aback by the fact that everybody we talked to thought this was a good return. I mean, the responses were well written. You know, people had taken a lot of care. But I was really disappointed with the low numbers. Yes, an important lesson to learn for an apprentice researcher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So what results did you get? Well, basically, the responses were extremely positive. The students said that doing the crossword on a computer helped them really focus on the work in hand and not be distracted, which is something that commonly happens with other ways of doing revision. Yeah, that was really clear. But something that struck me was that having fun hardly featured in their responses, nor did anything to do with spelling of hard words, which I thought would be an obvious benefit. No? Okay. Respondents also said that doing the crossword hadn't really increased their general motivation to study, but that it had highlighted the gaps in their memory so they knew what further work was necessary. Right. So how did your findings tally with those of the original researchers? There were lots of similarities, but... Uh... There were probably two main differences. We found that more males than females liked the technique, whereas the original study found the reverse. Also, our respondents said they wouldn't mind doing a crossword as a final official exam. Whereas in the original study, students said they would hate doing it, even if it meant having a shorter test. But of course, both sets of respondents said they'd be interested in doing more crosswords for informal purposes, revision and so forth. Right. So let's have a think about the whole project and what you've learned from doing it. Well, it was very time-consuming. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think we managed that aspect very well. <laughs> it could have been worse. I mean, we didn't have a lot of data, so we didn't have to spend ages processing it. 
And of course, we'd already done a course on numerical data processing, so there wasn't much new there. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I think we designed our questions well so that they gave us manageable data. Yeah, it really helped having the original study to guide us, as it were. And that helped us to see what a good research instrument is. What a good questionnaire should be like. Absolutely. We got a lot from that. But when we were writing up the project, I'm not sure whether we'll know how to acknowledge the work of the original study. You know, our referencing. No, that's something we'll both have to work on in the future. Actually, that part's been great. Finding ways to share and support another person. That's the real plus from the project. Learning ways to do that. Well, it's obviously been very successful. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4 First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, tell me about your research project, John. I created a questionnaire for the study to determine people's opinions of the relative feasibility of earning a living in Brisbane. Oh, cool. How is it scored? Are they all multiple choice questions? Well, the questions consist primarily of yes or no responses. There are two free response questions at the end. Participants will use a computer to fill in their answers. That way, it is really easy to analyze the data afterward. Great. It sounds like you have a pretty solid idea of what you should do. Just don't forget to submit a copy of your plans to Professor Curran by the 15th. Oh, I, I almost forgot. Hmm. You don't do it for the high grade or appraise, but he can review and give you feedback. Right, that will be helpful. He has been conducting studies like this for 30 years now. Yep. Oh, and I'm curious. Are you going to be in the room giving subjects directions for the questionnaire? Well, I think the instructions will be provided by another representative who will not be analysing the data, I want them to feel they can answer and be completely anonymous, so I will not be in the room. Anonymity is really important for this study. I agree. Good idea. You should tell the representative to remind subjects to fully consider both sides of each issue. Sometimes it's really easy to immediately check yes or no without stopping to think about it completely. That's so true. It's like a race to finish the questionnaire first or something. I'll make sure to include that in the instructions. This report has to be perfect. Wow, what's the big deal? I know it's part of your grades and all. Well, it's that, but also a well-executed study could grab the attention of faculty in the department, which would be a huge deal. So, for attention? No, silly. I mean, I could really gain the respect of professors who may later take me on as a graduate student in their labs. Oh, I see. Hi. 
Hi, Mark. Hi, Gina. What can I help you with? So we were hoping you could help us with this extracurricular project. Sure. What is the topic? Attending business school. This sounds like a great idea. So you're going to explain the requirements for getting into business school? Not exactly. It will be more broadly about the experience, the academics, accommodation, and social experience that comes with being part of the business school. I see. So, would your audience be the general public? Well, we would probably want more to focus on members of the institution. We would especially like to reach individual applicants to the business school. I see. Now, what form will this information be? You could give a talk to all the summer courses. All you'd need is permission from the course director, or you could pass out information outside the student union. Those are both good ideas. What about sending out pamphlets in the mail? Most college students never check their mail. Maybe you could make a video and show it on campus. That's a great idea. We'll do the video. Great. And as members of the business school, do you have an incentive to attract new students? If so, this idea is a great way to do that. No, the idea actually came about because of how much students like us worry about their studies. Yeah, when I got into business school, there were a lot of things I had not prepared for. So the video would cover a lot of things Mark and I wish we had known upon entering business school. Right. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.